So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Jeremiah, and today's episode, you're in for a shocking treat, because right now, we're at the Patapsco Valley State Park, working with a group of biologists from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, who are electrofishing to see what fish and other aquatic animals are in this section of the Patapsco River. Let's go down and join them. Keep an eye out for William, okay? Look, he's over there. Oh yeah, you're right. Hey William. Hi there, how are you? It's good to see you. Nice to meet so, you. So, your name is? Jeremiah. Hi. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi, how are you? I'm good, and you? So we're out here on the Patapsco River, and mm -hmm. I see everybody out getting ready to electrofish. Why are you guys doing that exactly? All right, so we all work with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and we're here doing monitoring in the Patapsco River as part of the dam removal project. Okay. So there's a big dam just upstream there, maybe half a mile, called mm -hmm. Bloaty Dam, and that's gonna get removed next year. And when that is removed, it's going to cause a lot of impacts to the river. Sediment that's trapped behind the dam is going to move downstream. The dam currently acts as a barrier, so it's like physically a wall. Fish are coming upstream, they can't get past it. Once that's gone, they can get on through. So a lot of stuff's going to change. And we want to know what changes and how much it changes and why it changes. So we're out now doing pre-removal monitoring to see what everything looks like when the dam is still there. And then after next year, when the dam comes out, we'll be out here more and we'll see how things look when the dam's gone. So why is this important? We need to know what kind of impact this removal project will have on the river. Um, the there are different stakeholder groups that have an interest in the Patapsco River. There are fishermen, there are patrons who come to the park here, there are legislators, there are all kinds of people that have an interest in the Patapsco River and in the surrounding park. And we need to make sure that this removal is actually a good thing. So we want to see what sort of impact taking the dam out has and see how the river improves once it's gone and be able to document that. So that's why we're out here today looking at the fish, we're out in the springtime looking at the insects to look, look how the biological signals change to show an improvement once the dam has been removed. So why was the dam put there in the first place? Well, Bloaty Dam was actually the first hydroelectric dam in the state of Maryland. It was built in the early 1900s um, and it was uh, the first dam that had internal turbines for generating electricity. Unfortunately, it did not function very long as a hydroelectric dam because there's a lot of sediment in the river. If you look out there, you can see all the sand in amongst the gravel, all this sand on the riverbank. Mm -hmm. That filled in behind the dam and filled into the turbines and within 20 or 30 years, it was no longer functioning to generate electricity. And ever since then, it's just been almost like a, it's a man-made waterfall. It serves no practical purpose and is actually a hazard. People have drowned at the dam. It's a barrier for migrating fish. It just it's a, it's a nuisance that we don't want on the river, so we're trying to remove it. Are there any other dams along the river? Uh, yeah, there actually is one more dam kind of close to here. Daniels Dam is 15 or 20 miles upstream. There used to be three other dams in the same area. Avalon Dam was just downstream from here. Um, upstream of Bloaty Dam, Simpkins and Union Dams were there. All of these were old mill dams to power factories, either flour mills, textile mills, um, because the cradle of the Industrial Revolution in Maryland was in Ellicott City. So ever since the 1700s, there have been dams on the Patapsco River, because the river was used as an energy source for the industries that cropped up in and around Ellicott City. Well, Rachel, it's about time to get you suited up to get ready to electrofish. You ready? Ready. Let's, Let's go. go. Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. I'm your host, Drew Cruz, and it's time to test your knowledge with another Aqua Quiz. Historically, the Patapsco River has supported spawning runs of anadromous fish, such as the American and Hickory Shad, Yellow and White Perch, Alewife, Blueback Herring, and the American Eel. Do you know what anadromous means? Is it A, fish migrating from freshwater to saltwater, or B, fish migrating from saltwater to spawn in freshwater? I'll have the answer after the break. Aqua Kids will be right back. Welcome back. Do you know what anadromous means? It's B, 
fish migrating from saltwater to spawn in freshwater. An example would be salmon that return to freshwater streams to spawn their young. I'll be back next week with another Aqua Quiz. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Hey guys, welcome back. Now, Rachel, I see you suited up in your waders, about to go out with them. Now, how do you feel? What's going through your mind right I'm now? I'm excited, but also scared I'm going to fall, but okay. let's hope not. Right, don't fall, <laughs> don't fall. Now, they're about to go out. I think you need to find William and go ahead and out there and have fun. Got it. All right. <laughs> So we're about to start our electrofishing pass. Uh, while that's going on, there will be electricity in the water, so don't touch the water. If you feel like you're going to fall in, yell and scream, let everybody know, and we'll turn it off. Uh, this electrofishing barge will be making noise. If you hear that beeping, it means there's electricity in the water. If you hear one of those backpack units beeping, it means there's electricity in the water. So you want to avoid that. Uh, while we're going, we use the anode here. That puts the electricity in the water and stuns the fish. Then we scoop it up with a net. So you're following along with your net. You want to keep the net in the water close to the bottom and scoop up any fish that you see. Okay. If one of us has too many fish in the net, we might need to put them in a bucket. We'll pass them to you. So the way we'll do that is you hold your net out horizontal. We'll flip into your net. And then if you go back to somebody with a bucket, you'll do the same motion to them to hand off the fish. Hey Rachel, how Hi. was it? It was fun. I was so scared that I might fall down, but it was fun. How, what did you catch? Well, I caught fish and eels. I think I'm a pro now. Yeah, you might yep. be. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when we come back, we're going to check the catch and measure the fish. Hi, Drew here. You know, it excites me to meet kids like us who love to protect the earth as much as we do. Young people who are pioneering powerful ways to conserve and protect our planet. I call them Eco Defenders. Let's find out what they're doing. I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, and the coal companies have historically been a huge part of the economy here. I remember the first time that I heard about dynamite blowing up the tops of mountains and then all of the coal being scraped away from the land. It absolutely broke my heart to learn that these destructive practices were happening so close to home. I've heard stories of bridges that have started to deteriorate because of the weight of all the equipment and machinery that have traveled over them. There's not money to fix the bridge. There's not money to repave. And I felt this huge call to devote myself to improving the situation. So I went and met Ann Lee, who is the executive director of SOCOM, statewide organizing for community empowerment. And she told me that the organization was interested in vamping up the only legislative instrument that ensures money from the extractions remains in the community, coal severance taxes. But after about a month of looking into coal severance taxes, I found that the severance tax rate in Tennessee for oil and gas is the third lowest. Not only was the tax rate low, the communities were getting a third of it. I met up with Ann and I said, hey, I know Sockham has done a lot of really good work on coal, but we can kind of see oil and natural gas stepping in and replacing it as coal declines. I think this is our opportunity to get ahead of this, get the legislative instruments in place. I want to continue to try to change what's wrong and make it right. And I think the law is a really powerful tool to do that and to see lasting institutional change that can really positively impact the lives of people and the health of our ecosystem and the world that we all share. Wasn't that great? Now it's your turn. If you or someone you know is doing something remarkable to help our planet, let us know about it. You could be our next Eco Defender. See you soon. 
Aqua Kids will be right back. Hi, Drew here. For more information on today's show, go to aquakids.tv. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. I'm here with Dave. So Dave, what do you guys found so far from the collection you just took? Well, um, we're probably up to about 13 different species of fish. All right. Uh, we're conducting a uh, fish survey of this stretch of the Patapsco River. Mm -hmm. um, and based upon which species, how many, um, it gives us a relative uh, indication of how healthy the stream is. So what species do you usually find? Uh, we find a lot of species in the Patapsco River. Uh, we found as many as 40 throughout the river system. On any given day at a site like this, we might get 25 or 30, and that's about how many we have today. I have a, a selection of those in this bucket if we want to take a look at them. So these little fish that you see at the top are banded killifish. They'll live uh, closer to the coast in larger rivers like this, and they'll also live out in the bay and in brackish water. So this is a male banded killifish. You can see his bands there. He's nice and bright and showy to show off for the ladies. They're a lot more, uh, a lot more colorful than the females, like this one here. They're very, very flashy. Uh, there are a lot of minnows in the Patapsco River and in other rivers in Maryland. Uh, a lot of people, when you think of a minnow, you think of a little tiny fish, like this here is called a swallowtail shiner. They'll get a little bit bigger than this, but not much. Um, these form the uh, forage base for other predatory fish that live in the river, um, but not all minnows are tiny. We also have this one here, which is called a fall fish, which is also a minnow. It's the largest minnow that lives in Maryland, and they'll actually get up to two feet long, so a good bit larger than this one is. That's a minnow? Yeah, it sure is. Um, we have some other fish in the bucket. Uh, this one is a smallmouth bass. It's a very popular target for anglers, like the fishermen that come to this river. Uh, this is one species that we're particularly interested in with this project because the river is very important to the fishermen in Maryland, and they'd be very concerned if these fish went away. So we've been watching how their population changes when the dams come out and when the river changes. This here is a red breast sunfish. Um, it's a male that's uh, getting close to spawning time. That's why it's very colorful. Uh, color is very important for a lot of fish when it comes time to breed. Um, you can see this sort of orangish pink on its belly. That's where it gets its name, red breast sunfish. Um, it's a native fish to Maryland, and it's probably the most common sunfish in rivers and streams throughout the state. I think there's an eel down there. Well, it looks like it, but it's actually not an eel. This is whoop, slippery is what it is. This is a <laughs> sea lamprey. Um, it's a larval sea lamprey. Um, it's a migratory fish similar to an eel, but they do their migration in reverse. Eels are catadromous fish, so they live as adults in freshwater and go out into the ocean to spawn. This sea lamprey is an anadromous fish similar to a salmon or a shad. They live as adults in the ocean and come back into the river to spawn. So this individual's parents swam up the river probably in April or May, laid eggs, and this hatched out. And it'll live in the river for a couple years feeding on plankton and other things that it filters out of the water column before it goes out into the ocean. And once it is out in the ocean, it'll develop eyes. You can see it doesn't have eyes right now. And its mouth, which is this sucker right here, will get much more developed and will have teeth in it. And they're actually a predator, almost like a gigantic leech and they'll suck on other fish for their food. Sort of like a vampire. Hey William, I got some eels here. I believe these need to be measured. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Hey Jeremiah. Hey Rachel. All right, so have you ever measured an eel before? I have not. All right, well you're in for a treat. <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead and try and pick one of these up. All right, uh, let me see, there's one right there. Uh -huh. uh, oh, come back, come back, come, okay. Yep. Yeah, they're pretty slippery, aren't they? Yep, they, okay, yeah. It's like that toy that you can never hold on to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so we have this contraption here to measure the eels because as you notice, they're very hard to hold on to. So if you're using a, a typical ruler or like mm -hmm. a flat measuring board, they'd be squirming all over the place. So we actually designed and built this measuring board specifically for eels. Because as you can see here, he's not going anywhere. Yeah. So we can slide the eel to one side or the other and be able to tell how long it is. Wow. So if we look here, its nose is already at, all the way at 800 millimeters, uh -huh. and its tail is, what is that? Can you read that on your side? 50, 49. So that would be, so this is 500 millimeters. 500, okay. So that would be what, 502? Two? Yeah. So that would be 502. And on our data sheet that we use for these, we write down both of these numbers. Okay. Because sometimes things can get kind of hectic when we're out in the field 
and math doesn't go so well. So we'll write down 800 and 502, and when this all gets entered in the computer back in the office, then we let the computer do the math so we don't make okay. any mistakes. So what's the importance of the measurements? So we measure the eels to see how uh, the number and size of eels throughout the river changes when a dam comes out. Um, the American eel, as I mentioned earlier, is a catadromous fish, so it's a migratory fish. It spends its adult life in a river like the Patapsco here, and it goes out into the ocean to spawn. When there are dams on a river, it impedes their upstream progress, so you end up with eels getting stacked up against a barrier. So there's a dam about a half a mile upstream from here that is one of those barriers to eels. So you tend to find more eels and smaller eels downstream of a dam and fewer eels and larger eels upstream of the dam. Now that's the, the hypothesis that we have and it's been seen in other systems, but we want to verify that here in the Patapsco and we can do that by measuring the eels that we catch. So we'll know how many and what size we have now and then once the dam is removed, we'll know how many and what size there are without a barrier. Okay. So how important is the eel to the ecosystem? Uh, American eels are very important to the ecosystem that they live in. Uh, they're often the top predator in a small stream. Um, you might find a stream that's maybe only a meter wide, far, far, far away from the Patapsco River, like upstream from here, and it'll have an eel in it that's three and a half, four feet long. And that may have lived there for 25 or 30 years, and it's, it's the apex predator in that system. Wow. And there are uh, observable impacts when an eel is removed from that system. Um, as the top predator, they control everything that's below them in the food chain. So if you remove an eel from the system, you see changes in the number of smaller fish, the number of crayfish, the number of insects, the number of salamanders. Um, it's, it's obvious when you look at a stream that has eels versus one that does not. Um, so that's one reason why we want to keep an eye on them and make sure they're doing well. Uh, they're also very important commercially, or at least they used to be. Um, a lot of that has closed down in most states. Uh, there used to be a commercial fishery in Maryland for, for small baby eels, and that's, that's illegal now only in South Carolina and Maine. Can you uh, collect the small eels? But they're, they're an important commercial fish in addition to an ecological and important species. Now you mentioned apex predator. Could you just explain to the kids at home what that actually means? Um, so yeah, an apex predator is the largest, most important predator in the ecosystem. So in a, in a freshwater stream like the Patapsco River or a smaller stream that feeds into it, the eels that we have here are, are basically the aquatic equivalent of a wolf on the Great Plains or out in the Rocky Mountains. Like nothing really that lives in there feeds on them once they're an adult and they, they run the show. They, they're just the most important predator and control everything down from them. So the eel's the boss, huh? Yep. Yeah, nobody messes with the eel. Want to keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. This next segment is awesome. It features footage from marine biologist and octopus expert, Chelsea Benice. It's a beautiful day in South Florida. We see a school of fish. And our first octopus. This octopus is searching for food in the sand. Crab is a favorite meal of the octopus. Their arms are lined with hundreds of suckers. They use their suckers to taste and catch food. Octopuses are curious animals. This one is checking out my camera lens. They use shells to decorate their homes. If you mess with their shells, they'll mess with you. You can see octopuses during the day. Watch out for that fish, Octo! You may also see octopuses at night. 
This octopus is using its arm webbing to trap prey. Octopuses have lots of predators. To scare or avoid predators, octopuses can change color. Look like a plant? Floating seaweed? Do their moving rock trick? Or jet away super fast? I'm Mermaid Bree, and you're watching Sea Inspiration. Now back to Aqua Kids. Well, Rachel, this wraps up another great episode. But before we go, tell me, what was your favorite part? My favorite part was when we were electrofishing with the guys. It was fun to help. Yeah, that did look like fun. Well, one thing I learned was that the dam upstream is scheduled for removal soon, but only time will tell if it have a negative or a positive impact on the environment. That's right, Jeremiah. We'll have to see. Well, this isn't goodbye, because we'll see you right here next time on Aqua Kids.